Good evening everyone. Welcome to our webinar this evening which is the death of the training contract. We'll be discussing the new training contract regulations and the new equivalent means route to qualification. My name is Mena Ruparel and I'm here today with Richard Burnham. I'm a solicitor and trainer and Richard is a paralegal. So between us we're going to present the webinar and have a discussion about the uh, content and the training regulations. If you've got questions, you should be able to see a panel on your monitor and you can type questions in. I will take questions as we go along um, and I'll stop as and when it's appropriate to do so to answer the questions. Uh, please do participate. We'll have a couple of polls in the next hour and um, if you would be so kind as to vote in the polls that would be much appreciated. It gives me an idea of uh, who signed up, who's listening in. We've got quite a full house today and hopefully you can all hear me and you don't have any um, technical problems. So what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about the death of the training contract. First of all, um, it's helpful to take the first poll. So the first poll just gives me an idea of uh, who everyone is that's listening. If you could take the poll that you should be able to see on your screen now, that would be really helpful. So are you hoping to qualify as a solicitor? So maybe a student or um, having done your LPC, you're working as a paralegal. Are you from an organisation that employs uh, trainees or paralegals? There are some people here who um, may be here to find out what the new training regulations are. Um, external recruitment consultant uh, working for a training provider or other. So it looks as though 60 or 70 percent of the people who have uh, voted are hoping to qualify as a solicitor. 14% from an organisation that employs trainees for paralegals and 14% working for a training provider. So that gives us a good idea that most of the people who have signed up today are um, hoping to qualify uh, and will be looking later on at what stage you've reached in the qualification route. So the first thing that we're going to discuss with Richard, who really is here, so he's going to tell us. I can confirm that. Mm -hmm. Um, is uh, what's happened to the training contract. So we read today that there are about 5,000 registered training contracts uh, or equivalent means qualification route contracts, if we call them that for the time being, um, that were registered in the last year. Um, but does the training contract really exist? What do you think, Richard? Well, with the new um, regulations that come into force, it's very difficult to say whether the, the training contract is still an entity in itself, um, particularly with the new equivalent means um, route. It's difficult to say that it does. Um, I don't know what you have to say about that. I think that from a, from a training provider's perspective, and for those of you who are from a training provider, it would be helpful to know what you think. Um, and if you've got comments, by all means, uh, type them into the question box. It's I think people refer to the training contract, which technically doesn't exist anymore, um, when in fact they're talking about the period of recognised training. So on the left of the screen that you have in front of you are the old training contract regulations, uh, which were governed by the 2007 training regulations, which I'll be calling the old regulations from now on. Um, under the terms of those old regulations, the SRA fixed the terms of the contract um, and they had been in place for a, a great many years. I qualified more than 15 years ago and I qualified under the training contract regulations, obviously um, some of the regulations that preceded the 2011 regulations, but the training contract was always fixed. It was a document that training providers and trainees couldn't really alter the terms of um, and if a training provider wanted to terminate the uh, training contract before it expired because it's a fixed term contract, they needed to apply to the SRA. If there were any problems during the training contract, the training provider or the trainee would contact the SRA and the SRA would intervene in some way. Um, and that's what people call and know the training contract. That's changed and we'll look at that in a moment. 
there was, as a lot of you know, a fixed minimum salary um, which was in place until the 1st of August. So if you were lucky enough to sign a training contract before then, you'd be under um, the fixed minimum salary at the very least, I would hope uh, very much more. The fixed minimum salary hadn't changed in a number of years. Um, so it wasn't really reflective um, of perhaps standard of living that you might expect as a trainee solicitor. Um, a training contract needed to be registered under the old regulations and trainees were required to undertake both contentious and non-contentious work. That's all changed to what we now call, and this is the information on the right hand side of your slide, the period of recognised training. So these are the 2014 training regulations, which are the new regulations. I've just noticed a typo on my side. It should be the first of the six that they came into place, not the first of April last year. So they've been in place just over six months. The problem here is that the employment contract terms need to be negotiated between the employer and the employee, and Rich has been looking into this today, um, because it would seem from the SRA website that training contracts are recognised as being a form of apprenticeship. Is that right, Richard? That's correct. Um, I mean, there have been a lot of concerns that obviously now the SRA's intervention isn't needed to dismiss um, someone on a training contract that that would put more trainees at risk. But the research I've been doing, particularly into the employment rights of apprentices, um, would suggest otherwise. Um, they're a more protected form of employee. It, it's not literally that um, people on a training contract have no employment rights. Um, I think, and I don't know what you think about this, that apprentices do have more protection under the, this scheme. I'm quite concerned that because the employer and the employee negotiate the terms of their contract, even though it's under mm. the terms of an apprenticeship, and I know from some of the research that Richard done, um, that there is some confusion from organisations that are employing trainees, um, that they will either take off the shelf any ordinary employment contract Very much so. um, and perhaps the trainee won't have um, such a strong ground to negotiate on. I'm thinking particularly with reference to, for example, um, taking time off to take your exams. Um, we'll come on to the PSC later on because there are some provisions about that within the training uh, regulations, the new regulations and the old regulations. But I would imagine that a trainee would feel uh, quite a bit more vulnerable under the new training regulations, particularly with regards to the contract, than perhaps they were under the old regulations. Trainees under the old regulations had the security of knowing that the training contract that they were entering into was much the same as a training contract that every other trainee was entering into, whereas now trainees will be presented with a contract and perhaps won't realise that the contract terms um, may not be uh, very good for them, may not have been um, drafted in terms with the apprenticeship route and potentially won't give them all the protections they need. Um, certainly one of the things that Richard's just mentioned is that the uh, training organisation no longer needs to contact the SRA if they are contemplating terminating the training contract. Mm. And certainly in my day, it was something um, that all trainees knew that they had the protection of, which was a two-year fixed-term contract. Even if a problem arose between the employer and the trainee, most employers didn't want to involve the SRA for any reason, and therefore wouldn't. They'd see out the rest of the training contract. You might not get a job at the end of it, um, but you would certainly be able to see the training contract to its end. And there, there are things there that we'll come on to discuss a little bit later that I think are really worth noting for those of you who are hoping to qualify as solicitors. So that's going to be something that you really need to think quite carefully about. The um, minimum wage from the 1st of August takes over from the minimum salary um, and that is now £6.50 an hour for over 21s. That means that at a very minimum you would be looking at earning just under £12,000 a year. Um, Rich is pulling faces because that's not an awful lot of money. Sadly not, no. And it really hasn't, um, the, the, the minimum salary hasn't been around for very much, but it doesn't change greatly. So you're looking at spending two years on minimum wage, uh, probably not working a fixed 35-hour week, and your contract will be subject to termination if you don't meet the requirements set out by your employer. And I know that um, we'll be 
coming on to organisations that can support paralegals and um, students who want to become trainee solicitors. Um, but I know that this is something that is still um, up for debate, uh, or certainly some organisations would hope to be able to open this up to debate in the future. Uh, just while you're on the subject of the minimum wage provision, um, I mean, the new regulations are really supposed to open up access to the profession, um, but consider the LPC cost, roughly 11000 on average, a lot of um, potential trainees will have borrowed that money and will be paying that back. Does this minimum wage um, introduction not frustrate their abilities to do that? Because I think a lot of people will be very hard pushed to afford the payments and at the same time live independently. I mean, certainly if you were living in London, you've got pretty much no chance of being able to pay back your LPC costs. No, I, I couldn't do it. Um, at, but, but, but in fact, as I said, I, I started my training contract uh, in 1994, I think, uh, or five, and the fixed minimum salary at that point in time was 14,000 if you worked inside London and 10,400 if you worked outside of London. Um, so the minimum salary that you would earn at £6.50 an hour isn't really that different to perhaps what I no. was earning, but that was 15 years ago. And certainly the LPC cost £4,500. Uh, a bit more manageable. <laughs> slightly more manageable, absolutely. Um, the other thing that we uh, need to mention on that slide is that registration has been replaced by notification. Uh, the routes to qualification are opening up and what's behind a lot of these changes as we'll be discussing um, and Richard has just touched upon is that the SRA really wants to ensure that people who want to can enter the profession and that it is not exclusively for people who can afford the tuition fees at university which again didn't exist when I went to university who can afford the LPC um, maybe the PSC depending the route that you're going down and of course living etc yeah. um, and what you'll find is that what you think of being the route to qualification which is law degree LPC PSC or degree CPE LPC um, is really nowhere near what the SRA has in mind and these are all changes that are occurring in the future um, and we'll be looking at that when we look at the equivalent means route which is like a stepping stone to what the SRA are hoping to achieve in the next year or two um, the final part that we need to mention is that the trainee is no longer required to undertake contentious and non-contentious work. And so that really came into being with the new 2014 training regulations. And that means if somebody wants to just do conveyancing for some reason, um, as long as within the period of recognised training, they can show that they have met all the other requirements, i.e. that they've covered three distinct areas of law, they don't need to do contentious work. Some people do not want to do any advocacy, they don't want to step near a court, they just want to do um, conveyancing or commercial contracts or whatever it is they want to do and they don't really want to even have to take a seat in contentious work and so that's something that has changed. I mean, does that not um, put frustrations on some elements of work because really a training contract should be about understanding the legal profession in general not just one specific area? Um, yeah, and I think that that's going to be reflected in the competence statement. Mm. So the competence statement is going to come into force, we think, um, in some form or another in April. Um, in the first instance, it's going to affect people with their CPD. So once you've qualified, it will ex it will change the way that people do their CPD. Um, that's another talk for another day. Um, but in fact, at the moment, what you have is that trainees are subject and will be subject at least until the end of the year to what are called the practice standard skills. So although from the, the new training contract regulations you don't have to do contentious work, the practice standard skills still say that you need to be competent to exercise rights of audience. So it means that you still need to know something about advocacy and contentious types of work, mm -hmm. um, but to what level um, is very 
very much left to the discretion of the training organisation. And a lot of this is left to the training organisation because the SRA don't really want to be involved. No. So, uh, And it's not just for trainees. They really don't want to be involved um, and want to really become a light touch regulator. Um, and certainly, so far as CPD is concerned, the, uh, the, the avenues that they have taken mean that they really are not going to be heavily involved in learning, training and education once they put the new scheme in place. Of course, slowly withdrawing from... That's right, they are slowly withdrawing. They are there in the background. And certainly, if there were problems in terms of supervision or enforcement, they would get involved. Um, but they're not going to get involved in minor disputes. So they will be there to give uh, ideas as to how to deal with matters and will be there for guidance. And they have a lot of guidance on their website at the moment, but they're certainly not going to be heavily involved. Um, there are transitional arrangements. So if any of you who are hoping to qualify started your training contracts under the old training regime, the 2011 regs, you can actually finish under the 2014 regs. If both training and training provider agree, the SRA don't need to be notified. I imagine if you work for an organisation where perhaps you were going to have a secondment in order to um, comply with perhaps the contentious or non-contentious element, then you would want to transfer over to the new training regulations, which means that you wouldn't have to do that seat in contentious or non-contentious mm. just to fulfil the training provider's regulations. I don't know any other reason, um, perhaps I haven't thought about it clearly enough, why anybody would want to transfer from the old regulations to the new regulations, particularly as you would need to sign another contract potentially if the um, old training contract is under the old regulations. So that's something that um, is there if people want to do it but I, I imagine it would be attractive to those people that do as you said want to qualify into conveyancing um, and their firms want them to qualify into conveyancing but may, might not have the capacity to put them in a contentious seat it might be attractive in that sense I also think that in the big firms in in what we would call the magic circle firms that their learning and development departments and certainly I've spoken to a number of people who work in this specialized learning and development department departments in one of the top 10 law firms um, and several other of the magic circle firms and they're quite keen on using these new regulations because their trainees know from a very early stage what it is that they want to do and they are begrudgingly put into either contentious or non-contentious seats in order to meet the regulations and so even though they do have the capacity mm -hmm. to fulfill that requirement under the old regulations it may be that the trainees don't want to and that really in order to retain talent and ensure that on qualification their their assets are doing what they want to do that Completely. they just don't mm -hmm. put them into the um, the seats that they don't want it's so essential to sort of develop more skilled trainees that way as well if they're sort of honed on one particular skill that's right and my background is is in high street practice really and i'm a specialist family lawyer um i think that there there are positives and negatives to specializing very early on um, and certainly both the large firms and smaller firms can benefit from these new regulations alike so let's move on to um, time off for good behaviour. <laughs> if that's one way of putting it. Yes. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Um, one of the paralegals that I spoke to recently um, said to me that he uh, was working as a paralegal um, with a training contract on the horizon, he hoped, and that he would be able to take six months off his uh, training contract. So I thought that I would really spell out for okay. you what the rules and regulations are because okay. I think that is it's necessary. It's very sort of blurred lines in, in that respect. A lot of people think it's an automatic six months. That's right. And in fact, under these regulations and the regulations that I refer to in the slides at 5.6 and 12.3 are references to the 2014 training regulations, which you can access on the SRA website. Um, there are two ways to do that. The first is that you can ask the SRA to recognize a period of periods of training which meet the published requirements for recognized training where it is appropriate to do so and in this section it ends off by saying including where a training principal for any reason has not certified completion of the recognized training now um 
What that means is that at the end of every period of recognized training or training contract, which we'll call it, the uh, training principal needs to sign off and say the trainee has done what they were supposed to do. If for any reason that that person isn't signing it off, then you could approach the SRA. So that that is an option that they are offering up, that you can go to them and ask for um, some training to be recognized where it's appropriate. What I think that a lot of people are referring to when they say that they can get six months off is this second provision at 12.3. Yes. And the training organization may recognize previous work-based experience. So that's before you've signed your training contract, if we can call it that, um, and you say to your training organization, I've done Richard works at my practice for a year um, in his sandwich course. So he, he did one year predominantly with me um, as a paralegal. And he could say to an organization, could you take off up to six months from my training contract? And he can ask, but they might not necessarily say yes. They can take a maximum of six months off, but it is perfectly within their discretion to say, no, we want to train you according to our training program that we have implemented at this firm. We would like to pay you £6.50 an hour for two years, and we're not interested in taking six months off. It's a delicate balance to be struck there between obviously what the employer wants and the trainees desire to qualify. Now if the employer said no, and I'm asking Richard this specifically, if the employer said no, you can't take six months off, Richard, how likely are you to under 5.6 say to the employer, well I'm going to the SRA? Well it's, it's a, a difficult position for a, a trainee to be put in, isn't it? Um, I wouldn't imagine there are many trainees hoping to get a job that were, would be brave enough to report their employer to the SRA. But, particularly when they can terminate your contract much more easily than perhaps before absolutely it may be that what you could do is 18 months into your training contract apply to the SRA but again you'd be making no friends with your employers That's if, the you, thing. Mm. if you did do that but in fact if you did do that and your training uh, principal hadn't signed off um, you would have no chance of getting a job there afterwards but actually the SRA could potentially take six months off your training contract and you would qualify six months early and therefore hopefully be earning more than six pounds fifty an, yeah. an hour as soon as you'd found yourself a new job of course um, so those two things do bear them in mind that it's a discretion both whether the SRA takes time off and whether um, the organization that you work for is willing to take time off also note the part-time experience can be taken into account. So if you worked in a firm for two or three days a week, it could be taken into account pro rata. So it's not just full-time work that is counted. The next slide sets out some of the conditions because there are, of course, conditions. Um, so the experience must have been within the previous three years. Uh, and... Richard, for example, worked at the firm that I was at coming up to two years ago. Two years now, yeah. Two years ago. So if he wanted to take six months off his training contract, he'd need to start his training contract within the next year um, in order for that to apply. Your experience would have had to have been in English uh, and, and or Welsh law and practice. You would have had to have experience in one or more areas of law. So um, Richard did about a year um, in the family department, um, but that covers actually two areas of law because family law and children law are two areas um, and mediation in family law is a third area. So in fact, um, his experience could be spread over those three um, and enable the acquisition of more one or more practice standard skills or the principles and that means that you have had to have done more than just photocopying and I think one of the questions that we put in our um, advertising materials is are paralegals going to be given more administrative work to do to frustrate the efforts to qualify 
I don't think they will. Um, because no, I, I don't. I wouldn't have thought deliberately, but I also think it comes down to luck of the fear, no? because some, like yourself, um, do give you a lot of hands-on work, but then you do hear horror stories from paralegals who are essentially um, placed on reception, for example, or left to photocopy documents, and that's their administrative tasks, and that's it. And certainly you wouldn't be able to take any time off your training contract if that's all your no, firm that's the thing. got you to do, even though you would be gaining valuable people skills and valuable skills in of dealing course. with clients. Um, I don't think that that would be sufficient to take any time off your training contract. Um, the paralegal needs to have been adequately supervised and praised. And certainly, um, I was a paralegal working for a firm uh, many years ago before I started my training contract. And I don't think I was ever appraised. I was broadly supervised, but I wasn't supervised by a solicitor. Um, and so it's important that somebody is supervising you appropriately and that you can show that when you apply for your um, exemptions if you're applying to the SRA. Of course, if you're applying, applying to a firm, it's within their discretion. Mm -hmm. um, if you've done a sandwich course, and I mentioned that Richard did yeah. do a sandwich course, um, any placement that you're on has to be for a minimum of three months, um, which I think must... It's usually a year, isn't it's it? It's usually a year, yeah. With an authorised training provider, and that can be difficult because some people don't get their firms authorised as training providers because actually they don't really take on trainees. They might take on paralegals, um, but they don't really have training contracts. So if you did your uh, sandwich placement with a firm that wasn't an authorised training provider, you would have difficulty in utilising the time that you spent with the firm. No, I mean, it's certainly not not something that was approached, um, sort of thought about during our sandwich, um, when we were applying for our um, placement years, that wasn't mentioned. So you do run the risk of having this experience and potentially being denied using it. And I think the, the point, if I'm not mistaken, is that people um, generally do the sandwich course because it's a year in industry and Completely. it's supposed to help you in the long term. So um, do make sure if you are hoping to qualify that it, any any work experience that you do is with an authorised training provider um, because it would certainly help you uh, if you do secure a training contract. Um, they also consider whether the trainee was paid. Certainly, they'd be looking at minimum wage or payment of some description. And again, lots of firms don't necessarily pay their um, their paralegals if they're doing a sandwich course. Um, the uh, guidelines given by the SRA as to whether to take into account uh, work experience from a sandwich course are that they would want to know whether the trainee completed the placement and did they get their qualifications or did they pass their degree and if you're not applying to the SRA then certainly these are questions that your training organisation will want to know before they decide whether or not to count your sandwich course. Now it doesn't matter that you did your sandwich course before you did your LPC, there used to be a rule that the time that you did in practice before getting your LPC only counted as half time and the, the time afterwards counted as whole time. That isn't the case now. So you can justify the work that you have done as long as it's within the three years um, and as long as you can show that you've acquired the practice standards and skills, which we have now but are likely to be replaced in the future with the competence statement. And we'll mention that again later on. So what are the training requirements that you need to meet? Um, a trainee must have practical experience of three distinct areas. This is slightly surprising to some because trainees usually do four seats. Um, and I think that's uh, historical. I don't think that that's um, a requirement. So it's three distinct areas and there is a list on the SRA website as to what distinct areas are. So as I mentioned earlier, family law, children law and family mediation are three distinct areas. So if you went to work for an, uh, an all family law oriented firm, you could still have a training contract and cover three areas. The period of recognised training should be not less than two years, so that's the two-year training contract as it was, if undertaken full-time, or you can do it pro rata if you do it part-time. Um, as I mentioned, it's no longer a requirement to do contentious and non-contentious work, and a training must be suitably supervised by solicitors and other individuals. 
So you don't necessarily just need to be supervised by solicitors, you can be supervised by other individuals who are more senior to you, who have the skills and experience, and there need to be regular reviews and appraisals. Um, certainly, I imagine that if you had a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Legal Executives who was supervising you, that would be perfectly acceptable. And a trainee should keep a record of training. The only reason that I am going over the training regulations is because it will impact on the equivalent means application that we're going to look at in a moment. So it's worthwhile just reviewing that. Now the equivalent means route. Um, there's another poll that I'm going to launch at the moment just to see how many of you who are hoping to qualify um, can just let me know what best describes your current position. So you've done your qualifying law degree, you've done a degree and the GDL, you've done one of the above um, and the LPC, so you've got to the LPC stage and um, you've done less than two years paralegal work, you've done more than two years paralegal work um, and again it gives you an idea and it gives me an idea of uh, who's done what and how much experience you have because those of you who've done more than two years will really seriously need to be paying attention to this equivalent means route. So I'm going to close that poll now and I can see that 25% of you have done the law degree, 13% um, of you have done the degree in the GDL and 25% have done the LPC in less than two years, 38% have done more than two years. So for those of you who are in the uh, category of having done more than two years um, paralegal experience, you're the ones that this next section are targeted at and certainly for those of you who've done less than two years, you should be really getting together the um, the evidence that you need for potentially applying for this equivalent means route. So what is the equivalent means route? What does equivalent means mean? Well that's something I think a lot of people are asking at the moment. It, um, training sort of provisions have been far from precise on this point. And I think I read something um, in a newsletter or an article somewhere where somebody had said that the equivalent means route was the new training contract and it's not. No, I think that's a very common misconception at the moment. Yeah, and I think they've been um, changing a lot of these uh, terms and the terminology and it's starting to become confusing, which is one of the reasons that we thought it was a good idea so. to do the webinar today. Um, so the equivalent means route isn't the training contract or the period of recognised training. It is an entirely new route to qualification. And this is part of the SRA's red tape initiative. They're trying to get rid of the unnecessary red tape. They're trying to open up the routes to qualification. And this was really seen um, by the SRA as what they call a stepping stone. It's a stepping stone to what is going to come later on this year. And that is going to be an opening up of the profession to people who perhaps don't have the means or don't want to take on um, big loans to pay tuition fees or pay the LPC and potentially come out of it with uh, 30, 30 or thousand pounds worth of debt and a wage which is six pound fifty an hour for two years. Very much so. So it was introduced by the 2014 uh, training regulations, regulation 2.2 if you want to go and have a look at it. and you can be exempt from lots of things. So you can do the academic stage, which is the, the qualifying law degree, CPE or exempting law degree, or the vocational stage, which is the um, period of recognised training by the equivalent means route. And what that means is that there are separate application forms, all of which are downloadable on the SRA website, which means that if you wanted to exempt yourself from the academic stage, for some reason you think that you don't have to do the CPE because you did an equivalent course of learning somewhere, um, you could download the form, pay your fee to the SRA, and if they think that you are right and you have done an equivalent course somewhere, then they will give you an exemption from that stage. What most of you, certainly the 38% of you who've done your LPC and two years paralegal work, what most of you will want to know is how to exempt yourself from having to do the 
training contract period of recognised training. So you can get an exemption from the LPC if you've done an equivalent means of learning. You can get an exemption from the period of recognised training and those of you who've done two years as a paralegal could potentially look at getting that. You can also exempt yourself from the professional skills course. What we're going to be concentrating on for the remainder of this webinar is we're going to be concentrating on getting an exemption from the period of recognised training, the training contract, two years. This is what some magazines call the paralegal qualification route. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people calling that that. That's right. Um, the paralegal qualification REIT is pretty much exactly what it says, um, is that you work as a paralegal, you qualify by making an application to the SRA, and you should know that no one has qualified using this route yet. No. It's not unusual because it was only introduced at the tail end of last year. The SRA have said that it would take a minimum of three months to turn around the paperwork on one of these types of applications. Having spoken to and listened to a webinar that the SRA have given, um, there is mention of the first person qualifying under this route coming through within the next month or so. Um, I, w I thought this might happen in January, but obviously it didn't. Um, if you can show the SRA that you can fulfill the training requirements as a paralegal, so at the moment, if you were to make this application, you would need to meet the practice standard skills, they can exempt you from the entire um, period of recognised training. I say at the moment because the competence statement, um, which the SRA are going to introduce in April for CPD, is likely to apply to day one competencies for newly qualified solicitors later on this year. So as long as you can show them that you've met those training requirements and they've got the evidence and will look at what you need to show them in a moment, then they will exempt you from having to do the entire period of recognised training. So that means that the 38% of you who've already done your two years, if you've got the experience and you've got the evidence and you submit your application form off, you don't need to do your training contract. You could start in six months time maybe once you fill in the form and it's been turned around by the SRA, you could be a newly qualified solicitor. They will want to see evidence of your experience and we'll come to that in a minute when we have a look at a snippet of the form. And the SRA have indicated that they want to know if you've worked alongside solicitors, the legal nature of the work you've undertaken, the level of supervision. Supervision appears time and time again so it's important mm. that you are being supervised feedback, appraisals, your interaction with clients or similar. They'll be looking for a clear alignment between the work you've done and the work which would be done by a trainee. Now what they don't say is whether they're looking for alignment between the work you do as a paralegal and a trainee in your own firm or the work done by a trainee and that would be a fictitious trainee. The, the reasonable trainee. The reasonable trainee because certainly um, I worked for one of the big city firms as a paralegal the trainees perhaps would photocopy things until midnight, um, but they would be taken along to client meetings. Yes. Um, but the paralegals actually did a form of legal work. It was pretty much box ticking, but they weren't taken along to meet clients. So there was a distinction between the work done by a paralegal and a trainee at those firms. Most of the distinction was hours based, though. Oh, really? Mm. So it was how many hours are you willing to spend photocopying as right. a trainee <laughs> solicitor for vast amounts of money? You know the feeling. <laughs> as compared to the paralegals who clocked in and out, basically. So this is something that is going to be ironed out over time. If I was in the position that many of you are in who are taking this webinar today and I had done two years paralegal work, I certainly would be looking to make the application now early on before they iron out all the wrinkles and although it might take longer than it would in a year's time um, I think that being one of the first always has its advantages whilst the SRA are ironing things out. I also wonder whether it's worth applying now before the competence statement is introduced. Um, the draft competence statement is on the SRA's website and um, I was involved in a series of workshops with the SRA to draft the competence statement so I know what it says. I also know that 
the SRA are contemplating various routes to qualification. So there's going to be a huge overhaul at the end of this year. So there isn't going to be a period for, I think, 18 months to two years where things have settled down and everybody knows where they are. It's very much up in the air at the moment, isn't it? And I think that the tendency is, particularly when we look at the costs of the application form, for people to say, I'll just wait and see what happens. Um, I, I think that um, seizing the day now could be advantageous. I agree. So how do you apply? Well, you download the um, equivalent means application form. Remember I said that there are several forms. Make sure you download the right to form. It's the exemption from the period of recognised training. Um, you can get exemptions from the academic stages or the PSC potentially. So make sure you download the right form. We're going to look at a snippet in the next slide. Um, the fee is £600. And I mean, it could be considered fairly onerous for some trainees or paralegals in that position. Well, I could see that you were wincing, Richard. I did bring this up at a meeting. I went to the SRA um, for a meeting at the tail end of last year, and I brought up as part of the general discussions that £600 seemed to be a lot of money um, for what is effectively an administrative task, processing an application form. But I was assured that this money merely reflects the amount of work that is required by the SRA to process the form. That should give you an indication of what evidence requirements they're going to need mm. because the SRA say it's going to take a minimum of three months for them to process your form and the £600 is reflective of the work that is done. It becomes more sort of justifiable when you consider what they'll be going through um, and what you need to establish and what they need to sign off. I think I, I can imagine that people are holding back on making this application or at the end of this webinar will hopefully go away and download a copy of the form and, and see what it is. But I, I think if I was a paralegal, I would certainly be um, chancing my arm at this stage oh, completely. with 600 quid. I guess by the time you've spent multiple thousands of pounds um, on <laughs> wanting to qualify as a solicitor as many of, uh, as many of you have no doubt done and um, another 600 quid towards your uh, end goal is in the scheme of things not very much um, so what evidence do you need you need to have met the practice standard skills today if you make the application which will be replaced by the competence statement in the long run. As I've said, the SRA themselves are used to dealing with the practice standard skills and again you can download the information from the website. Um, it's fairly detailed and I think that it would be easier for your employers to help you to complete the form as they will have to do in some respects um, because they're going to need to produce evidence that you've done what you think you've done um, rather than deal with a competence statement. The profession is in a state of flux not just for routes to qualification but continuing professional development and other things. And I think you will make it quite onerous on your employers if you wait till the end of the year. Um, if you've got a choice, do it now is my advice. Oh, yes, I definitely agree with that. Because as Richard mentioned, there are lots of things that are up in the air, but practice standard skills are not one of them. They've been around for quite a long time. Once you print them off, you will recognise the practice standard skills. Um, and it's something that your firms will recognise, which they won't necessarily when they see the competence statement which is entirely new to the legal world um, there are three distinct areas that you need to have covered now so as I mentioned in my area child law family law family mediation are three separate areas many of you I imagine um, will have been used as paralegals in one specific department for a long period of time yeah I think that's quite typical um, a paralegal will be put in one department and then sort of they will stay there um, unless there's a progression onto a training contract, in which case, obviously, they will change seats at that stage. But I think the standard business model is a paralegal support, supports a specific department. Um, and that's, that was the case when I was a paralegal. You, you moved about, and we were all working on one big project, um, which was a litigation project, and we would move around in different phases of that litigation, but we wouldn't move away from litigation because there was no point in training us up in any other area. No. It may be that some of you are in the the, the percentage, 25% of you, you've done less than two years. If you can persuade your employers to move you in order for you to meet the training requirements for three distinct areas, then see if you can do that. If you're a valued member of staff, 
if there's an opening where someone's left or one department is particularly overwhelmed with work, conveyancing at the moment, um, there is a lot of it and not enough people to deal with it, then do try and persuade your way into another post if you think it's going to help your application and go back to the list of distinct areas on the SRA website to see if you can make your one uh, seat or your one role count as more than one distinct area. I, I do think though that there runs the risk of um, f frustrating um, the process because paralegals, the current paralegal business model doesn't, well, I don't think it supports um, this uh, objective of this RA um, and a paralegal is not going to find themselves pushed out of jobs because firms won't want to hire them purely for them to get their six months experience and then move on to another area of law. Is there not a risk there? I think there is, but I think that employers can be, the employers that I know, and I'm choosing my words quite carefully, can be a bit complacent about paralegals, that they are easily replaced. Um, having a look today online, there are lots of paralegal positions. And in fact, if you are in a paralegal position and you need to move somewhere and you've stayed there in the hope that they will offer you a training contract, you might want to start changing the way that you think. And rather than staying with a firm with a training contract dangling in front of you, you might want to ask yourself whether you're better off moving to a, a paralegal position in another area of law. As long as you can meet your evidence requirements, you could paralegal hop your way through three distinct right, areas right. of law. Um, and you could probably do it quicker than persuading one firm to meet your training contract mm -hmm. desire. I think in that respect, a lot of firms do have to be quite careful about their paralegals now, um, because obviously dangling a training contract in front of them isn't enough anymore. And I'm not sure whether people who are offering jobs to paralegals necessarily realise that these paralegals who have invested a huge amount of time and a huge amount of money, which they are going to need to pay back, Completely. are not necessarily going to be waiting around on minimum wage no. for the, the promise of a training contract, which unfortunately a lot of firms have no intention of offering Sadly so. to their mm -hmm. paralegals. Um, so for those of you who can, um, you might want to think about paralegal hopping your way through rather than getting one training contract. And it may be that actually that turns out to be the career of choice. Yeah, I think it, you, you allow yourself to build, well, essentially a training contract, if we're going to call it that, but a more structured training contract to your desires. So essentially by choosing different employers, you can build your training contract um, based upon where you want to go. So if you want to do family law and then litigation, it, it's there. Yeah, and I think that that's something that really I would encourage um, everyone to think about very seriously, the employers um, who are listening to this, although they're in the minority, and those of you who are wanting to qualify, that those traditional models that maybe your careers advisors are still telling you are traditional models. Maybe you are at an organization and they're saying, well, this is what we do because they don't know that there are all of these mm -hmm. other options. It takes a remarkably long time for lawyers to react to change, and that's all they usually do unless they are very big city firms they react to change they are not proactive and potentially you could go into work tomorrow having listened to this webinar uh, tell your training principal tell your supervisor something about this webinar and they will probably think you're mad or that you have misunderstood something uh, a lot of my colleagues have sort of when i've gone oh i want to get excused from the training contract have looked at me and gone nice joke so yeah it's, it's really very fresh very new um, but it, it needs to be adapted to. And I, and I think that the I think that the paralegals who are taking this webinar um, are likely to be the forerunners um, and will smooth the pathway for the people that follow, hopefully, to use the equivalent means route. So you need to show that you can comply with the SRA principles, um, which, again, are available on the website. And these are the things that we do every day, current confidentiality, for example. Um, but you, the one thing that I think can scupper you is independent evidence that needs to be provided for each of the learning outcomes and this is where if you are about to start a paralegal position or you want to paralegal hop your way through the training contract um, 
that you should really think about how you choose your paralegal positions because quite often there's not a huge amount of difference between paralegal positions say for not usually the money but it's the department that you're going into you may want to uh, approach your interview slightly differently um, when you look at the um, the evidence that you need to provide so Apparently we're hoping to reduce the amount of time on the um, training contract, if we call it that, or the period of recognized training. It would be a good idea for them to start to keep a training record um, that accords, accords with Regulation 14. So Regulation 14 just sets out how you keep your training record. There is a template on the SRA website. I don't think that the template is particularly good um, because it's very generic. Yes, whereas the sort of hoops you have to jump through are quite specific with That's equivalent right. means. Um, and I think that if you are hoping to use equivalent means, then you may as well start to keep a draft of the equivalent means application form as your training record so that you're not having to fill it out twice. But I definitely think if you are in the category and more than 50% of you have done your LPC um, and some paralegal training, if you're in that if you're in those categories, you should definitely be keeping a form of training record. And my recommendation is to use the equivalent means application form, which is the more detailed of the two documents. The training, con the training record, which is um, on the SRA website as a template, isn't that document. Now, um, there are 10 outcomes in the equivalent means application form, and this is a snapshot of it. So in the first column, you can see it says the outcome that needs to be demonstrated. The SRA um, is what they call an outcomes-focused regulator. The principles that we abide by um, are, are outcomes-focused, and for many years weren't. They were a code of conduct. Um, and so you would need to show in this section, number one is application of technical legal knowledge. So you need to show that you have the ability to identify the relevant law and legal implications associated with an issue. So you take one of your three distinct areas of law, you set out in that box knowledge and skills that you claim and how you have achieved them. So you um, potentially use a star-based system and set out um, a situation, uh, the task, what you did, what the result was, um, and the area of law, so family law maybe, and evidence and support. And this is where I suspect that people are going to come unstuck because you need a letter, a certificate, a reference, or even a job description um, that sets out that you have done the thing at 1.1 that you say you have done. And you will notice that that column runs all the way through across 10 outcomes, um, and you need to provide evidence of every single thing that you say. So this is what I think is going to be slightly difficult and this is where if you have the option of going into a firm and you are asking them what they're going to offer you it may be a good idea to ask them whether or not they would be prepared to give you evidence and support and it can be quite daunting when you're looking for a job I imagine completely yeah um, it will also be more daunting if they say they don't understand what you're talking about yeah, I think because it's so fresh when you get, if you go into an interview and to throw all this at um, someone um, who potentially doesn't have any idea what you're talking about, it, it's very difficult to do a job interview, I think, but you do need to sort of get an awareness of whether they're willing to support your application. Otherwise, you, you will just come unstuck at this stage, I think. So somebody's just asked a question, which I think I'll answer now, which uh, um, is, is it possible to gain the two-year equivalent means experience at two different organisations? Now, I imagine the person who's asked the question is asking about equivalent means rather than the period of recognized training. Um, I'll answer both just in case there's a confusion. So equivalent means is this paralegal qualification route. And yes, you can get the experience at two different organizations, which is why I was talking about paralegal hopping. So when you fill in this form, if you can demonstrate 1.1 at firm number one and they give you your evidence and support but you can't demonstrate 1.3 um, at the same firm then you just go to a, another firm you get them to provide your evidence and support so you could actually use more than one organization um, you can also do your period of recognized training at one organization but they can send you out for secondment um, so for example if you can do 
two distinct areas at one firm, your contract is with them and they send you out for second, secondment to another organisation who fulfil the third area of law. So yes, it's possible to do both the period of recognised training and the equivalent means application at different firms. The issue with evidence, as you can see on the left hand side of this screen, is that each outcome needs to be supported. Now it may be that you've gained this experience with one firm, you complete the form, which I suspect will take you a week to complete. I imagine so, I mean, it was incredibly horrendous seeing it for the first time after we were talking about it originally and then seeing how much was involved. It's, it's not an overnight kind of job. It's not, and what you don't want to do is you don't want to hassle a current employer no. or an ex-employer to fill out something for you. So you need to fill out this form yourself and make it as easy as possible. Now the evidence in support says letter, certificate, reference, job description. If you wrote a template letter, for example, and you sent it to your current or ex-employer and said, this is what I'm planning to do, this is not going to cost you anything. And I would be really grateful if you could sign this on your letter headed paper. Um, then it's possible that that's all the SRA will need is an organisation or more than one organisation to confirm that the content of your application form is true and correct. Yes. So all work experience claim must be supported by written references from employers. Um, the references must be recent, so they must be dated within three months. So you need to make sure that the whole form is complete. You then send it with your template letter to your employer, ask them to sign it, date it, return it to you. And they need to include within the letter or certificate um, that the letter is specifically for the purpose of this equivalent means application. So it cannot have been a general letter of satisfaction that they wrote several months ago. Um, so moving on from from the evidence, what do you want? What do you need? What do you do if you get the exemption? So you you've been successful. You're one of the first paralegals in the country to go down the paralegal qualification route. You may still need to do the professional skills course at the moment. And again, this is potentially subject to change in the next year or so. You need to do your professional skills course. It's six days. Um, it costs about a thousand or just over a thousand pounds. I think it's usually just over, yeah. Um, and you can do it at any one of uh, several organisations. You can do it evenings, weekends, part time. It's quite flexible. It's yeah. quite flexible. At the moment, um, it's recommended you do it during the period of recognised training. But if you gain the exemption, then you may want to take a week um, or just over a week and do the PSC. If you do that, um, then you can apply for your first practicing certificate once you've completed the professional skills course. There are other hoops that you need to jump through, such as suitability. You need to show the SRA that you are suitable by signing a declaration. Always bear in mind that if you have any transgressions during your period of recognised training or during your paralegal time, you may need to let the SRA know because it could nullify any work experience during that period of time. The SRA have the ability to say to you that they don't think that the work that you did during your training contract, for want of a better word, um, was sufficient, that you need to do more time. So they can nullify a year of your training contract. They can do the same with your equivalent means and they can say, actually you uh, didn't pay your train fare going into London, you were caught by a ticket inspector, uh, you were given a fine and you should have declared it to us, the SRA, you didn't and therefore we are suggesting that for six months of your paralegal work you can't claim it. Which is quite, I imagine, a horrible thing to be slapped with. I think the thing about suitability is that you need to make sure that you over disclosed rather than under -disclosed. very much so yeah. um, and the fact that you've disclosed means that they will trust you more than if they find out from another means um, if you are a trainee the training provider is required under the training regulations to pay for the first attempt for the professional skills course they don't have to I don't think give you time off to do it so they just need to pay for the 
course they don't need to give you a time off they can insist that you take some from your holiday time I believe yeah so that's what you need to do I'm just reminding you at this slide that if you've got questions we're coming towards the end of our webinar so now's a really good time to ask questions if you've got them a couple of more slides so there are changes afoot in the future one of the questions that we posed um, in the um, marketing materials is whether or not it's worthwhile doing the LPC well it's something that's definitely close close to heart here because um, I haven't done my LPC and I'm, I'm wondering with all these changes is the LPC going to be a requirement in a couple of years do I wait it out um, and see what happens or commit to the quite expensive course um, my personal feeling is that there is going to be change at the end of this year. Um, having been to a couple of meetings with the SRA recently, um, and there is a recorded webinar on their website in which this is mentioned if you want to double check what I've said, the, um, the idea of opening up the profession is very real and is something that the SRA are taking very seriously, even if other people aren't taking it very seriously. Certainly the universities and training providers are very uh, uncertain as to what's going to happen, but there is some indication that training contracts that are starting in September 2017 would be affected by the changes that the SRA are going to introduce. Yeah. That means that everything from the qualifying law degree to the LPC to the PSC, the management course stage one is likely to disappear, um, we know that, and the, the two years of period of recognised training are all going to be impacted. That means that if you were asking me whether I wanted to spend more than £10,000 on the LPC, mm -hmm. I would say no, I'm going to wait it out until the end of the year. So I certainly personally wouldn't take up the LPC in September this year. I think it's much more sensible to wait it out and see what's going to happen. That's a fair point, I think. It's been two years that the SRA have been consulting about changes to the profession. Um, they have commissioned a, a report, the Legal Education Training Review, um, which is I think more than 100 pages long and they really are committed to ensuring that the profession can be opened up and that means change, huge change. Oh, massive change. And I know you were saying that people have said to you, well, they're not going to get rid of the LPC. But then again, in the same breath, they said that about finals. That's right. So before I took the LPC, I um, a couple of years ahead of me, people took Law Society finals and they did get rid of the Law Society finals and it was a sea change then. I was in the first couple of years of people who took the LPC. So within my career, they've, they've already changed the route to qualification and that means that they are more likely to do it again. Mm. And certainly the SRA now, um, and, and it, which didn't exist then, is a very different organisation than it was five or six years ago. Very much so. Um, so I don't think that I would take the LPC. I think it's a big gamble for a lot of money. It, I think it's the financial risk, um, and particularly as obviously there's going to be changes at the end of the year. I may well wait it out and watch this space. Yeah, that's right. I mean... Again, the law degree, I don't think, is going to be subject to a huge amount of change. Um, there is a document called, called the, the Knowledge of Legal Understanding, um, and it's basically the broad knowledge that solicitors are expected to have before they qualify. Most of that is gained through your law degree, um, and I don't think that that is going to change hugely, um, but I think the LPC, certainly because of the, the cost of the LPC being a barrier to qualification, is likely to change, or the LPC will stay, but they will introduce something else, another pathway that might make it cheaper and easier to qualify. So watch this space with that regard. I think it's really important that paralegal students are kept up to date. So um, the Junior Lawyers Division of the Law Society are there for that specific purpose. Open to paralegals, trainee solicitors of up to five years PQE. The membership is free. I think you told me that you follow them on Twitter. Yeah, Twitter LinkedIn. and LinkedIn. Um, um, and so you get their information, what they're doing, their campaigns particularly, um, 
and I think that it's really helpful to stay up to date, particularly in a time of change like this. Well, that's the thing with where everything's in um, flux so much. It's it's crucial to stay ahead of the game. That's right. And you're talking about a lot of money. You're talking about a lot of money that Very you're all, so. um, that you're all dedicating to wanting to qualify. Um, the SRA website is a good place to stay up to date with reference to future consultations and this is the year that people who want to qualify as solicitors should really stay up to date because it's the period at which the qualifying law degree LPC PSC equivalent means training contract are being reviewed so this is the year where those bits are being reviewed in the last couple of years the SRO have been concentrating on continuing professional development and they've broadly got their plan in place and changes are happening in April but as I say that's a, a different course for a different day but at the moment if you want to be fully involved the junior lawyers division and keep an eye on the SRA website for their future consultations because if you want to have a say you'll be given the opportunity to do so when consultations open so that brings us to the end of our webinar again there's some time for you to ask questions otherwise Richard is going to introduce our competition yeah, so um, Mena's new company, um, Law CPD Solutions, is currently running a coaching session for paralegals and trainees as well. That's right, yeah. So anybody who wants a free one-hour coaching session, we're going to choose five winners. Yeah, so um, they're drawing the what was the potential winners from how many entries you make on these different sites. So if you follow them, Law, Law CPD Solutions on Twitter, that's one entry. If you retweet the webinar tweet that um, we'll put out on Thursday morning, another entry, follow the company page on LinkedIn, um, join our discussion group that we'll be having on LinkedIn, which is going to be a continuation of some of the topics we've talked about today, um, or post a comment on our webinar thread. And again, um, we'd love to hear what you think about these new training um, regulations. And some of you got a few questions, so we'll be able to build upon that now. So if you're watching the recording and you wanted to ask a question, uh, then great you can post it on the LinkedIn thread somebody's asked what if you already follow the company I'll include that as your one entry which is fine um, yeah I think the, the coaching session was something I actually did with Mena and it's extremely helpful because um, it's, it's not to direct you um, as to where Mena thinks you should go it's, it's more about your personal situation and where what's best for you and certainly with everything up being up in the air it's, it's very good to sort of get a focused um, sort of direction so I would definitely recommend one of the coaching sessions with Law CPD Solutions. Thank you Richard, no I problem. didn't even pay you to say that. Um, <laughs> there are some questions so let's go through those so uh, is there any help provided for completing the equivalent means forms? Um, it's something that we offer as a pay for service so we certainly will help paralegals um, for a fee to fill out the forms and the question goes on to ask if you submit the application form to the SRA and they reject it do you need to make a new application we don't know the answer to that because the SRA hasn't even processed the first form so I imagine the SRA being what they are they would say this application has failed you need to try again and you need to submit another £600 application well, fee. Well that's something I read in the Law Society because that is you do lose most of the application fee most of was the phrase they used so I imagine it probably will be another application but again we don't know at this stage. I also think they are, the, the SRA are quite fair and their £600 fee is based on how much work they need to do yes. in yeah. going through the application form. I imagine if they write to you and say well your application has failed because you haven't met this particular um, outcome then they will potentially give you the opportunity to make it up and say well if you can send this within three months then we'll look at your application again um, so I think it will really be dependent on how badly you missed the equivalent means application if there were lots of things wrong with your application form um, then they perhaps won't give you that opportunity so then what we do is we help you to fill in the form and or we can review the form for you before you send it off a bit like the post office passport checker service you know you fill it in we let you know what we think is uh, right or wrong or where we think that your application is a little bit soft. So uh, the next question, not on the LPC, but do you think five years of paralegal experience would be useful under the potential new changes? 
uh, currently studying ILEX. I think if you're currently studying ILEX, what you need to do is potentially just stick with your ILEX because um, under ILEX, you're, um, from what I understand, your um, work experience will count towards that. I certainly wouldn't encourage you to do the LPC as I mentioned earlier um, and I think that your paralegal experience would count but it would very much depend on exactly what you've done, how client facing it was um, and whether or not you can meet those learning outcomes. I don't think that they are really fixed as to whether you've done the LPC or you haven't done the LPC which used to be the case. So I think that what they've done now is said we're more interested in knowing what you've done rather than when you did it. So I do think that your five years experience would count. You might be able to gain an exemption from the LPC and certainly I haven't mentioned ILEX because they have very different exemptions. The Chartered Institute have different exemptions um, with the SRA so if you go the ILEX route then ILEX will be able to give you more information about what you need to do next. Um, I don't think, oh lots of, lots of complimentary things. Oh we try. <laughs> Thank, thanking us for our efforts this evening. Thank you for listening in. Hopefully we've covered all the main points that you were expecting us to cover. We'll be sending out a link um, tomorrow probably to our um, recording which we'll upload. So if you think that maybe your employers could benefit or you've got a friend who maybe should have listened in, then the link will be on the website which is Law CPD Solutions and we'll be sending a link out to that. So in the absence of any other questions, we will call it a night. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening.